Hi everyone! Today we'll be talking about high yield hematology presentations. Like the previous videos, I'll be mentioning a vignette, take a second to pause, try to guess the answer, and let's get started. So the first patient's going to have a low hemoglobin, a low MCV, and it's going to be a female with fatigue or an elder patient with blood in the stool, low ferritin, low serum iron with a high TIBC. So this is iron deficiency anemia. The next patient's going to have a low hemoglobin, low MCV, with a high ferritin, low serum iron, and a high TIBC. So this is going to be anemia of chronic disease. For this one, remember that hepcidin is an inflammatory molecule that leads to this presentation. So patients that have chronic disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, with that chronic inflammation, they can get this sort of anemia. And anemia of chronic disease can either be a microcytic anemia or a normocytic anemia. So look out for that. The next patient's gonna have a low hemoglobin, low MCV, with basophilic stippling and lead or isoniazid use. So this is sideroblastic anemia. And remember the basophilic stippling looks like a bunch of little dots all over the red blood cell. Next, we're gonna have a patient with low hemoglobin, low MCV, frontal bossing, and hepatosplenomegaly. And then on peripheral blood smear, we see target cells. So this is beta thalassemia. The next patient's gonna have low hemoglobin, a high MCV. They're either gonna be alcoholic or pregnant, and they're gonna have a high homocysteine, but a normal methylmalonic acid level. So this is folate deficiency or vitamin B9, folic acid. The next patient is going to have a low hemoglobin, a high MCV, a history of a gut resection or an autoimmune disease, and then they get numbness, tingling, and fatigue, a high homocysteine, and high methylmalonic acid level. So this is going to be a B12 deficiency. So remember, B9 and B12 deficiencies are always compared to each other. Um, the key difference is folate does not have neurologic symptoms, but B12 does. Okay, and remember for B12 deficiency, it tends to happen over years versus folic acid deficiency is a lot more short term, so it can happen quicker. Another thing with B12 deficiency, vegans tend to get it more frequently as well. Okay, so look out for those specific risk factors. And B12 deficiency is the one with pernicious anemia where you get uh, antibodies against intrinsic factor. And when you don't have intrinsic factor, B12 is not able to be absorbed in the terminal ileum. Okay, look out for those. Next, we have a patient with a low hemoglobin, normal MCV, high LDH, high indirect bilirubin, low haptoglobin, and a high reticulocyte count. So this is a hemolytic anemia. Next, we're going to have a patient who's African American. They get pain in the hands and feet, hepatosplenomegaly, and boat-shaped red blood cells. So this is sickle cell disease. Now remember in this condition, initially your spleen gets larger, but over time you actually get autosplenectomy. So you're actually at risk of getting three big pathogen infections, which are gonna be strep pneumo, haemophilus, 
and Neisseria infection. So make sure you vaccinate your patients for those organisms. Other things to look out for is Salmonella osteomyelitis. Um, and remember a lot of these conditions that they get like the sudden uh, pain in the hands and feet called dactylitis, as well as acute chest syndrome, strokes. This is all due to vaso occlusion. Okay, so look out for that. The next patient is gonna have a red blood cell membrane defect, small red blood cells with lack of central power, and a high MCHC. So this is hereditary spherocytosis. And remember, it's an anchorin or spectrin mutation, and it damages the red blood cell membrane and makes the red blood cells very fragile. So the osmotic fragility test is going to be positive here. Um, and the spherocytes is because the red blood cells look very sphere shaped and they lack that central pallor. And these patients have an increased risk of getting pigmented gallstones. So they might need a cholecystectomy and they also might need a splenectomy because these spherocytes clog up the spleen. The next patient is gonna be a male eating fava beans or recently took an antibiotic. And now they have bite cells and Heinz bodies seen on a peripheral blood smear. So this is G6PD deficiency. And because it's X-linked recessive, look out for the males that get this condition. Next patient is gonna have hematuria in the morning it's a complement mediated issue, and there's a lack of CD55 and 59. So this is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. The next, we're gonna have a patient with hemolytic anemia, Coombs test positive, IgG against the red blood cell antigen, and a history of CLL or SLE. So this is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And remember the Coombs test tells us that there's an antibody present and the antibody is causing this hemolytic anemia. And it's very common in patients with CLL. Remember that's the one with the smudge cells and then SLE is lupus, right? So look out for the malar rash, the joint pain, the anemia, symptoms like that. Next, we have someone with either mycoplasma pneumonia or infectious mononucleosis that has the Coombs test positive and they have IgM against the red blood cell antigen. So this is cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia from IgM, okay? Next, we're gonna have a patient with a low hemoglobin, low white blood cells, low platelets, it's gonna be non-hemolytic, which means the reticulocyte count is going to be low. And there's a fatty infiltration of the bone marrow with a high EPO. So this is aplastic anemia. Next, we're gonna have a patient with low hemoglobin, normal white blood cells and platelets, also non-hemolytic with a low reticulocyte count and a low EPO. So this is chronic kidney disease. Here, remember that EPO is made in the kidney. And so when your kidney's not functioning, you're not able to make the EPO, which is responsible for letting your bone marrow know to make the red blood cells, which is why you get these findings. Next, we're gonna have a patient with a normal platelet count increased bleeding time, a defect in GP1B, and it's a platelet adhesion issue. So this is Bernard Soulier. Next, we have a patient, normal platelet count, increased bleeding time. This time it's a defect in GP2B and 3A, and it's a platelet aggregation issue. So this is Glansman thrombosthenia. Next, we have a young female with heavy menses, an increased PTT and bleeding time with an abnormal risk acetin assay, and you can treat it with desmopressin. 
So this is von Willebrand's disease. And remember, von Willebrand's factor has influence on our platelets and on factor eight, which is why your bleeding time and your PTT increases. Okay, and desmopressin is a treatment because it helps increase the factor eight activity. Next, we have a patient with a low platelet count, increased bleeding time, and GP2B and 3A antibodies form. So this is ITP. Next, we have a patient with a deficiency of Adam TS13, low platelets, increased BUN and creatinine, fever, confusion, and schistocytes. So this is TTP. Next, we have a kid who gets bloody diarrhea after eating a burger, low platelets, increased B1 and creatinine, and schistocytes. So this is HUS, and remember this is caused by a specific E. coli strain. Next, we have a patient who's a boy with knee swelling or bleeding after mild trauma, increased PTT, and it corrects after giving factor eight. So this is hemophilia A. Next, we have a patient, again, a boy with a swollen knee, increased PTT, but this time it corrects after giving factor nine. So this is hemophilia B. And remember, the hemophilias are X-linked recessive, which is why boys get these uh, conditions more. Next, we have a patient with a severe bacterial infection and they're bleeding from the IV lines. And on labs, we see a high PT, PTT, and bleeding time with a low fibrinogen. So this is DIC. Next, we have a patient with nephrotic syndrome who gets a stroke. So this is antithrombin deficiency. And remember, patients with nephrotic syndrome are peeing out all the antithrombin, which then makes them hypercoagulable and at increased risk of clots. Next, we have a patient who gets skin necrosis after warfarin use. So this is protein C or S deficiency. Next, we have a young female who gets a stroke or pulmonary embolism and has a history of recurrent pregnancy losses. So this is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Next, we have a patient who gets abdominal pain, psych issues, it's a PBG deaminase defect, and we treat it with hemin. So this is acute intermittent porphyria. Next, we have a patient who has hepatitis C, gets blisters on the back of the hand that worsens in the sun, and it's a uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase defect, and you treat it with phlebotomy. So this is porphyria cutanea tarda. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I really hoped you enjoyed watching and good luck studying.